once again to the Upper Room. Uh, so glad you've invited us into your home. It's another beautiful day on the western slope of Colorado here in December, believe it or not. Not much snow around, but uh, we come to you from an interesting place to me. It, it really have no significance to you, but really significant to me. Right behind me you see this two-story blue house. And when I was a kid, that house was green. It's 19 Eaton Court. And that big tree there you see off to the left of the driveway, that was uh, something that we planted when I was a kid. I was living here in this house, uh, probably between grades four and eight, I would say. So a part of my childhood and some of the most significant memories I have of my childhood took place here at 19 Eaton Court. I could take you to the different spots in and around the house where I broke windows and pictures. <laughs> Happened many times, three or four times. Uh, we were playing ball with friends in the, in the neighborhood and broke windows in the house and pictures inside the house, with always with balls. Uh, you know, never just knocked them over. We're playing something with balls and broke windows everywhere. Uh, I could take you upstairs to that second window and that was my bedroom. So things at 19 Eaton Court have changed somewhat over the last 45 years. Uh, the backyard, I'm sure, in fact, I got to see it about uh, seven or eight years ago, and all the trees we planted are enormous now. And uh, so things have changed a little bit. I had a basketball hoop there in the driveway. Uh, that was where we broke some of the windows. <laughs> but it was a great place to grow up. It really was. Now the reason I wanted to film from this spot isn't just sentimental reasons for me. Uh, so every Christmas Eve I would press my nose against that window and look down onto the driveway waiting for Santa Claus I guess. But I knew exactly what I would see. At some point my dad would go out to the trunk of the car and pull out the presents. And these were pre-wrapped presents and so I did my best to see what exactly I'd be getting. Now, I knew it was for my parents, but at the time, you know, uh, some of the presents anyway had the tag on it that said they were from Santa. And I never argued about that, but I understood exactly who had given us these presents. So that was a big deal. When I think of Christmas when I was a kid, pressing my nose against that bedroom window and looking down and seeing my dad pull out I was hoping would be an enormous box and I was hoping it would be for me. Now, the good news in that story is that I no longer do that. I no longer look out the window on Christmas Eve and press my nose against the window and hope that Santa or somebody or my parents show up with some presents. It's, isn't it amazing how much I've grown? I'm kind of awestruck with how much I've grown over the years. I want to uh, encourage you to think of Christmas, and Christmas is just a, a couple of weeks away now. So this is our kind of our special Christmas message, although we're going to get back to the upper room. I want to encourage you to think of Christmas a little bit differently. As I just explained how I thought about Christmas, it was all about the gifts and what I would get and sure Santa and all that went with it, the Christmas tree. And we usually think of Christmas as a very sentimental time, kind of a warm time. Uh, I know that's not true for all people, but I grew up in a great family and, and that was just a great, great traditions around those things. Uh, Christmas morning, getting up and running down, waking up our parents and couldn't unwrap things until they got up and got out of bed and came downstairs. But today I want to challenge you to think of Christmas a little differently. Instead of, oh, Christmas just brings such warm, comfortable thoughts, familiar memories come back and just kind of stay in that, you know, that comfortable place. I want to challenge you, and this probably will surprise you, I want to challenge you to think of Christmas as a great time to grow. And what I just explained to you is just how much I've grown over the years that I, I still don't look to Santa to bring me a lot of happiness and excitement. So that's one step of growth, see? But I think there's other steps of growth that we can take. And I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, Christy and I were driving the other day in the car and that song came on the radio uh, that was written in 1979 by Randy Brooks called Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've never listened to the words of that song. You know, you just hear it kind of think that's kind of a strange song. I actually listened, Christy and I listened to the lyrics to that song. <laughs> I was pretty impressed with the lyrics. And here are the words that Randy Brooks penned that still are being played today on the radio. Are you ready? 
She'd been drinking too much eggnog, and we'd begged her not to go. Don't go, Grandma. But she'd forgot her medication, so she stumbled out the door into the snow. When they found her Christmas morning at the scene of the attack, she had hoof prints on her forehead and incriminating claws marks on her back. Now we're also proud of Grandpa. He's been taking it this so well. See him in there watching football, playing cards, and drinking beer with Cousin Mel? And it's not Christmas without Grandma. All the family's dressed in black, and we just can't help but wonder, should we open up her gifts or send them back? A blue and silver candle that would have just matched the hair on Grandma's wig. I've warned all my friends and neighbors, better watch out for yourselves. They should never have given a license, no, to a man who drives a sleigh and plays with elves. And now the chorus, and the chorus is all important to understanding this really quality hymn. Grandma got run over by a reindeer, walking home from our house Christmas Eve. You can say there's no such thing as Santa, but as for me and Grandpa, we believe. So what is that song about? It's actually about the evidence that this writer has as to why he and Grandpa believe in Santa Claus. We believe because we had the evidence that he ran over Grandma one year. So it poses the question, have you gotten past believing in Santa? Did it take Grandma having to expire as a result of a tragic accident for you to get past Santa or maybe stop believing in Santa if you haven't. That's going to be your first step of growth this Christmas. <laughs> but there's going to be some other steps of growth I want to talk about. And you've got to be asking, what in the world does this have to do with the upper room? So glad you asked. Here we are, John 17. The context is Jesus is praying. Now what's interesting about this whole chapter is that he spends about 90 to 95 percent of the time praying for his disciples and for us the disciples that would come even hundreds and thousands of years later but it's here in the beginning of the prayer that he says something that i think connects to what we're talking about as far as this time of year so we're in john chapter 17 we're going to read verses 6 through 10 so if you haven't turned there by now i hope that you will and read along and you're going to see a connection here in just a little bit here we go verse 6 i have revealed remember jesus is praying his eyes open to the heavens as he often prayed i have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world they were always yours you gave them to me and they have kept your word now they know that everything i have is a gift from you for i passed on to them the message you gave me they accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. Verse 9. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. First discussion question. Without looking back at the text, if you've got your Bible open, I want you to close your Bible, and I want you to talk about how many times in that brief passage, the word give, given, or gift is used by Jesus in his prayer. All right? Let's see if you can figure this one out. Don't cheat. <laughs> Now, if my count is correct, and I think it is, six separate times in that short passage, Jesus refers in his prayer to something being given to him, to a gift, and it's always about the fact, except for one of the times, it's always about the fact that God, his Father, gave him his disciples as a gift. He also mentions once that a message was given to him to give to his disciples, but this entire passage has this idea of giving and gifts interspersed within it. Uh, there are some other themes in there, but it uh, you know, makes sense for us this time of year to just pause and say, you know, there's an awful lot about the Father giving to the Son and how that's the nature of the Father. He's the ultimate gifter. I don't know if you've ever thought about God that way. When you describe God, no one's actually ever described God to me as the ultimate gifter. But he is. You know, the most famous passage of all, John 3.16, is about God's nature of giving his son to us. He didn't just give his son to us. He gave his son the disciples he had. Now, it'd be easy for us to say, okay, let's move on in the upper room. We got that. Let's move on. I'm not so sure about that. So I'm guessing at this point you're saying, Steve, we got it. It's, this is about giving. It's about Jesus. We're not elementary on this whole thing. 
but there is still a chance that we could be misled uh, regarding this whole Christmas season. And so I want to take you to James chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 16, 17, and 18. It really clarifies the fact that we're not just givers by nature. We didn't come up with that on our own. So here we go, verse 16 of chapter 1 of James. So don't be misled. There you go. Don't be misled. The previous verses talked about the fact that God cannot cause us to sin. God would not do that. He's not capable of tempting us and leading us into sin for anyone that might think that's the case. And now he goes to the other end of that and says, not only will he not tempt us to sin, but listen to what he says now. My dear brothers and sisters, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. If there's anything good in this world, it comes from God the Father. It does not come from this world. It does not come from us. Do you get that? So when it comes to how God's character works out with us, he doesn't lead us into temptation. He's not evil. He does not have that on his agenda, not even within his capability. Instead, if there's anything good, James says, remember James was the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. He says, if there's anything good, it has to come from the Father above. We go on who created all the lights in the heavens. He's talking about, you know, obviously they didn't have street lights, like this street light that was out my, outside my bedroom window that was there just so I could see at night and see what kind of gifts were coming in for me on Christmas morning. The lights he's talking about are the lights in the heavens, the stars and the planets, the sun. And he says, our Father is not like those lights. Well, what's the deal with those lights? Well, they're always changing, right? They're always moving, or at least in appearance, they always feel like they're moving. And so he says, our Father isn't like that. He's not constantly changing. He never changes, in fact, or casts a shifting shadow. And then James finishes this section in verse 18 by saying, He chose to give birth, and he's talking about regeneration. He's talking about spiritual birth. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us who the true word is. It's Jesus. We have a new birth, a spiritual birth, because Jesus came to this earth. This is a Christmas passage, right? <laughs> Jesus comes to this earth. That's what you need to know. The greatest gift we were ever given was the birth of Jesus. Jesus visiting our planet. And then he finishes this way. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. That's really important. We could spend many lessons on that. Out of all creation. Now, the occult would have us worship this earth and to worship the creatures of this earth but right here James says no this earth and everything on it is not the prized possession of God the Father you and I are the prized possession how did we get here because God gave to us just like he gave to Jesus the disciples and the message to give to them 2,000 years later we still are receiving the gifts from the Father and every good and perfect gift comes from him. Don't think that this world, uh, do I have to even point to the government? Don't think that the government ever gives us gifts. They are not capable of doing that. There is always evil intent. That's the way this earth operates. That's the way the systems of this world run. But God and God alone is responsible for all good gifts. Okay, so let's keep growing through this idea because it was one thing for me to grow past the place when I was 12, 11 years old of wanting Santa to bring me things, okay? What would be the next step of growth then, according to what we've just read from the book of James? To get us into the next step of growth that I want to encourage you towards, uh, I want to talk about it as something that was a really a new idea uh, to me, probably going back to college, but especially for Christy and myself, and early in our marriage, this was a new idea. And not all new ideas are equal. You know that, right? Not all new ideas are as good as other new ideas. Uh, I had a friend post this the other day. This meme said the great thing about being cremated after you die is that you can be put in an hourglass and still take part in family games. Yeah, see, I'm going to say it's not as good of an idea as what we're about to discover. So growth step number two for myself, uh, for Christy and myself, uh, many years ago, at least 25 years ago, maybe beyond that, was this one idea. Don't think for a second that anything surrounding the Christmas season is about anything but the birth of Jesus. It is his birth. And again, I know you know that, 
But what I began to struggle with when I was in college and then early into our marriage was this idea that on the one hand, I say this is about the birth of Jesus, but on the other hand, I act, we act, most of us in the church act as though it's about something totally different. Yes, we mention Jesus and we might go to a Christmas Eve service, but it's really about this idea of what am I going to get and what do I need to give. And when I was in college, this famous speaker came to our college once and he was talking about this concept and he said this, what do you give people who have everything? Now think about it. Christy and I, our family, we feel like we have everything. Really, I, I, there's nothing we can imagine we need. And I knew that was true of our family years ago. And I know it's true of most of our relationships with other people. What do you give people who have everything? And then he made this stunning declaration. He said, I'll tell you what you give people who have everything. Nothing. You don't give them something they don't need. It's the idea. And that just struck me as, I've never heard that before. Well, that was the seed that then grew. And then Christy and I, about 25 years ago, said, you know what? All our lives, we've said this is about Jesus. We, we acted as though it was about us and other people getting stuff they don't need, right? And so we decided to make some changes. And, and the changes were immense. I mean, our families didn't totally understand it, but we just quit giving gifts to our kids at Christmas time. And we explained it to them. as probably when our oldest son was about seven years old. So he had the most difficult time with it because he had already experienced getting a plethora of things that he didn't need. The way we explained it to him was simply this. It's not your birthday. Now, fortunately, how this worked out for our oldest son is his birthday is four days later from Christmas. So it was easy for us to say, hey, you're going to have your day in four days. That's when you'll get showered with gifts. We will celebrate the wonderful thing you are. And yet today is not your day. It's Jesus day. Well, what do you do then? Do you just sit at home and pick your nose? Well, what goes on then? Well, then we discovered Matthew 25. And Matthew 25, at least part of that, I think the last part of Matthew 25 is where Jesus says, when you have done something for the least of these, you've done it for me. Well, who are the least of these? And he, he goes on to describe them. People in prison, people who don't have clothes, people do, people who are in need, people who are on the low rung of society, people who are basically not noticed. And so we began to look around for the people who were not being noticed. We considered giving to them as though we were giving to Jesus. And man, after thinking about that and praying about that for a while, the dam broke and it started all kinds of great traditions that we have till today. Like the 12 days of Christmas, many of you know about. If you want to know more about it, get a hold of us. We'll explain it to you. We know a lot of families right now who say it's not Christmas unless we do the 12 days of Christmas. We looked on Christmas Day at the people who were being forgotten. And we found that in the nursing homes, those people are actually imprisoned there. They can't just get them walk out. And they are Jesus, to us anyway, on that day. So we'd go and visit people in the nursing homes. We'd take uh, roles and things to people, first responders who were working. They were away from their families on Christmas Day. And so they were kind of forgotten. Unless you have a fire at your house or an accident, you don't even think about the fact that some people don't get to be with their families on that day. And so it just started a whole new world, and it was a second step of growth for us. And it has been the most incredible thing. Uh, it's not just that we do those things. We, we send money, Christmas money that we just spend on each other, giving each other things we don't need. Sent them to ministries that really care for those who are the least of these in this world. And I tell you, our life really changed. And our younger kids, that's all they've ever known. And so when they see around them in this culture, people, you know, just going into debt to give people things that they don't need, they just kind of don't understand it. They, they don't get it. But again, it's not just what you take away. It's what you fill it with. That was a huge step of growth for us. So the first step was I quit looking out the window waiting for Santa to come. The second step was early in our marriage, we decided we're going to celebrate differently. We're actually going to celebrate Jesus instead of ourselves on that day. I want to talk to you now the remainder, the remainder of our time. <laughs> and the remainder of our time, I want to talk about the third step of growth that is fairly recent for me, especially. And I just want to share it with you. I'm not saying you have to take this step. I'm just going to tell you it's been a step of growth for me. And I hope that if you feel inclined that you would join me in this. And it's not a difficult one, although I think it'll surprise you a little bit. 
Okay, so let's go to that third aspect of growth that I want to encourage you in. And I'm telling you, I'm going to challenge you. You're going to put your big boy pants on, or if you're not a boy, you're going to have to put some other pants on. I don't know. But here we go. The challenge is this now in our next step of growth, and that is to continue to appreciate the birth of Jesus. But let's now go beyond that and appreciate who Jesus is right now. Let me introduce it this way. In Norway, the country of Norway, they celebrate what I'm talking about now every year. Now, having said that, not everybody in Norway even knows what they're celebrating, as is the case here, of course. They don't even know what they're celebrating, but they celebrate this thing I'm about to introduce to you once a year. Discussion question, what is it? What do you think is the thing that once a year on the calendar for the people of Norway, they celebrate, even if they don't even know they're celebrating it, they get a day off to celebrate it. I think you'll be surprised, but see what you can come up with. So how that discussion go? Here we go. What is it that the country of Norway celebrates, even though most of them don't even know they're celebrating this? It is the ascension of Jesus. The birth of Jesus is about the descension of Jesus. Him descending. That's actually a word, by the way, descension. The birth of Jesus is the descension of Jesus. Jesus coming down to our planet from the heavens, from his throne on high, and he, we celebrate it like crazy, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to ask you to stop celebrating that. That's a great thing to celebrate. But what if we began to even move past that and realize we ought to be celebrating the ascension of Jesus? I'm going to give you some passages that will address this and the importance of this and just see if this can kind of materialize in our lives as an appreciation. Maybe see it as a step of growth for all of us. Whether you've noticed it or not, all throughout the New Testament, the New Testament writers wrote about the ascension of Jesus. You see, we, we kind of forget about it. You know, we're, we're big on the birth, really big on the birth, pretty big on the death and burial and resurrection. But the ascension gets lost. Here we go, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God, and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sin, there's the, the crucifixion, when he had done that, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. See, the Hebrew writer doesn't leave out that important part. He says Jesus is the exact representation of God the Father, and Jesus cleansed us from our sins, and that's where it ends for most of us, but not for the Hebrew writer. He goes on to say, and now he has sat down at the right hand of the Father. Let's go on. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. What attitude did he have? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Christmas. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Christmas. Crucifixion. You know what comes next? the resurrection. But the story does not end there for Paul. You think that's the end of the story. The climax of the story actually comes next in verse 9. Here we go. Therefore, because of Christmas and the crucifixion and the risen Jesus, now we get to the good part. Isn't that crazy? I mean, we all know that the crucifixion, the birth and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is is, is awesome. And it's, 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 it's all consuming. It's all consuming to us. But now Paul says, there's, there's one more part. Therefore, all that happened so this could happen. God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
The climax is not the resurrection. The climax is Jesus on his throne and every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, that means demons, every creature will bow and confess who he is. Do you see how important it is that we don't stop with the resurrection and certainly not stop with the birth? I know most people in this culture, I don't really know anybody that doesn't understand, at least intellectually, that Christmas is about the birth of Christ, but that's where it ends. And then we think, so why, why if Jesus came here, why do we keep living for ourselves? I think it's because the, the story doesn't get finished. Certainly the rest of the story about him dying for our sins and being resurrected may get finished for some people, but the last part of it that's so essential is that he now has ascended on high. So I want to ask you, just point blank, do you celebrate the ascension of Jesus as much as you do the birth of Jesus? That the ascension of Jesus is just as important as the birth of Jesus, and yet hardly any of us celebrate the ascension of Jesus. So, can we make this the next step of growth at Christmas time? That we don't stop with the birth of Jesus, but we say, and then there was more. Ultimately, people need to know that Jesus ascended on high. There's a passage out of the Old Testament, and you're, you're probably familiar with the idea that the New Testament writers fairly often quoted Old Testament works. That's all they had, actually, for Scripture. They were writing the Scripture of the New Testament. And there's one passage, Psalm 110, that is quoted 13 times in the New Testament by the New Testament writers. It's as much or more than any other chapter. Maybe Psalm 118 is close, but it's amazing to think that this one psalm is quoted more often than any other Old Testament passage. Are you ready for it? Let me read it to you. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool underneath your feet. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. You will rule over your enemies. Verse 5, the Lord stands at your right hand to protect you. He will strike down many kings when his anger erupts. Okay, how important is this? Look what Jesus says when he's confronted by the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, who don't believe that he actually is the Messiah. And here's how it works. Then surrounded by the Pharisees, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Messiah? There was a belief amongst those leaders that the Messiah would be a descendant of David, but that's all there would be to it. And so he says, so what do you think? What do you think about who descended from David? He's obviously talking about himself. So they respond to Jesus. He is the son of David. Jesus responded, then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, that's really important, call the Messiah my Lord? Now notice that. He flat out says the Spirit of God inspired David to write this. We know that in the New Testament, we are told that the writers of the New Testament were inspired to write what they wrote by the Spirit of God. Watch what Jesus does. He quotes Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath their, your feet. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, Jesus says, how can the Messiah be his son? No one could answer him. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Son of David is Jesus, is the Messiah. You've heard Jerusalem called the city of David. Jesus is the son of David. And so he says to these leaders, he says, I am the Messiah, and it was predicted by David through the Holy Spirit that my father would tell me the time is coming when he will invite me to sit back down next to him and rule over all our enemies. But the important thing for us to get from this is this, is Jesus sits down on the throne at the right hand of God and places his feet on the footstool which represents his enemies. He reigns over them. Okay, so what, Steve? So what? We know that. We, we, none of us are arguing Steve, that. No one, no one here is saying he's not sitting at the right hand of God. But what I'm telling you is that it is who Jesus is right now that we need to appreciate. Not just who Jesus was 2,000 years ago in a cradle. There's a, an old stupid movie uh, that you don't have to watch, but it's uh, a movie where the star character is praying. He's saying grace, and he, when he addresses the Lord, he says, Dear baby Jesus, dear 8.6 ounce baby Jesus, infant Jesus, and his wife sitting at the table with her kids and friends and you know grandparents, his wife calls him out and says, Jesus isn't a baby anymore. He grew up. 
and he looks right at her and he says, but I like baby Jesus. And when he says that, I think he's echoing what most people believe. I like baby Jesus. So I'm going to talk to baby Jesus. And I'm going to get excited on December 25th about baby Jesus. That's what I want to do. But the next step of growth for us is to say he's not a baby anymore. Who is he now? That's important. Let's fast forward to the book of Revelation. John, again, arguably Jesus' best friend on earth, one of them anyway, writes this in Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 10. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. Have you ever heard that before? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? When they looked in the furnace, they saw someone like the Son of Man, the Son of God. And he says, someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. <laughs> Can you tell that I'm staring right into the sun? That's what it was for John. When he turned around, when he heard this voice that said, write this down in a book, he turned around and he looks right into the face of the sun. We were told since the time we were little. I remember being told, living right here, don't ever look at the sun. Well, John looks right at the face of the sun or the son of God, and it is like looking into the brilliance of the sun. And verse 17 wraps up and says it all. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. Remember Isaiah said the same thing? But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. All right. That's who he is now. I'm amazed at how excited we get to celebrate the baby Jesus and how much we like the baby Jesus, how comfortable we are with the baby Jesus, but how hesitant we are to say, but that's not who he is anymore. He now sits on the throne and he holds the keys to death and hell. He is almighty. He reigns right now. Do you celebrate that? We turn now to Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 13. John now writes about the Son of God coming back. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe... At his thigh was written the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We've read that before, but i got to tell you again, that's who he is. He's not a baby anymore. Sure, celebrate the fact that he came here. But don't fall short of celebrating. Grow into celebrating, I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he is an awesome, awesome force. And all the evil in these nations will be put under his feet soon. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice that he ascended on high. Think how important this is. If he rose from the dead, but then he just lived a normal life from then on, and he just died later of uh, Alzheimer's or COVID or cancer, or he fell off a roof by putting lights on for the Passover, what would we be, have to celebrate? What would we have to give us hope? He would have lived a life just like the rest of us then, and uh, nothing more to be said. He didn't. He ascended, sat down on high, and now he reigns over the universe as well as our hearts and minds for those of us who are the children of God. Isn't this immensely important? We must get to the place where this is more important to us than even celebrating a baby in a cradle. So I want to give you a phrase that's kind of rudimentary, but I want to give it to you anyway. Maybe it's something you can hold on to, you can remember, as this next step of growth. And that is this, large and in charge. <laughs> I don't mean to minimize anything about Jesus, but he is large and in charge. He is the largest. He is the greatest. And he is absolutely in charge. No need to panic over what we see going on around us. 
there's such a great line we may have talked about it before in C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Susan is talking to Mr. Beaver, and he says, uh, Aslan, the lion, who represents Jesus, of course, Aslan will be coming. You will meet Aslan. And she asks him, she says, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver says, safe? <laughs> safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good, and he's the king, I tell you. Isn't that a great line? You're not going to feel safe when Jesus comes back. I mean, we're going to fall flat on our face like John did. But he is good, and he is the king. And that's who he is now. Let's appreciate who Jesus is right now. I don't know if you know who Andrew Torba is. I want to quote him. He is the guy who founded what's called Gab.com. Here's what he writes. He's going to talk about the oligarch. You know what the oligarch is, right? It's a small group of people who want to reign over the whole world, and we're seeing that beginning to happen. And so he's going to refer to the oligarch, but listen to what he says about it. I know for certain that the one thing the oligarch regime fears is Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can stop them. Not any politician, not some billionaire, not me, only Jesus. He goes on now, listen. Christ is our king right now, and it's about time that we start acting like it. We need to stop sitting around moping and being stepped on by the enemy. Jesus is not some hippie Mr. Rogers that our culture makes him out to be. He is the king of kings. He reigns. He rules. He flips over the tables in the temple. He brought the temple down on a pile of ash in 70 AD, as he said he would. He scorns the den of vipers. He rebukes the synagogue of Satan. This is the Jesus I know and worship. This is the Jesus of Scripture. Christians better start getting to know him fast. That says it all. That's the step of growth I want to just challenge you and encourage you to step into. Just in case you're wondering about Torba's quote, I'd already written this message before I found his quote. So this, this message was not written around his quote. It's written around Scripture, about who Jesus is. It's just that Torba had a great way of, of putting it. So I don't know if that scares you. The Jesus is coming back with blood dripping on his robe, comes as a warrior, as the king. But I tell you what, it should bring you some assurance that we are on the right side in all of this. And we win in the end because we're with him, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Remember what James said, all good and perfect gifts come down from the Father. He will send his son back at the perfect time and it'll be the greatest gift because it'll all be over as far as this sinful, decadent, dead world that we live in. And new life begins with him in eternity. I look forward to that. That's who he is now. We've got to grow into who he is now, not just spend all our time thinking about a cute baby. Yes, he was a cute... I assume he was a cute baby. I don't know. I, yes, he was a cute baby back 2,000 years ago. That's not who he is now. Have you ever heard of the Winchester Mansion in the Bay Area? Let me give you the background. It's really an interesting story. The Winchester Mansion was built by Mrs. Winchester many years ago. Her fortune came from her husband who invented the Winchester rifle. So let me tell you about that mansion that she had built and why she had it built. Unfortunately for Mrs. Winchester, her husband and her child passed away and she went into a tailspin. She eventually landed in the occult. And so she had this thing built. She had the wealth to build this incredible mansion. She evidently believed that it's so enormous and so tricky to get around in that death would not be able to find her like it found her husband and her child. The construction of the mansion occupied 16 carpenters for 38 years. It contained 2,000 doors and 160,000 windows. More windows than there are in the Empire State Building. It contains doors that open up to brick walls and secret passageways, hidden corridors, staircases that run into the ceiling and go no further. All this was done evidently to confuse death. However, as she was still building, death came for her. Death was not confused. Death has a wonderful sense of direction. <laughs> right now in our culture, it seems like everybody is fearing death. Even those of us who claim to know the baby Jesus. Okay, maybe the baby Jesus couldn't save you from death. But who Jesus is right now, he holds the keys to death and hell. Death and the grave. He holds the keys. We have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to run from. 
some of our lives right now look like the Winchester Mansion. I mean, we're just running around hoping death doesn't find us. Death will find us. But we have the one who sits on the throne. That's where we will grow now. Past just being people who worship a baby in a trough to the ones who worship the king on the throne. Do you remember Phil Robertson from Duck Dynasty fame? Uh, he's a strong believer. Uh, I think he might have even been the pastor of some kind. I want to read a quote from him. He said this, basically, I don't ever move too far past the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because it's of first importance. And I make sure it's of first importance with anyone I'm talking to. It all comes down to that, really, when you get right down to it. So it's not complex. Jesus removed our sins and guarantees we can be raised from the dead. I agree with him, except I don't think that's all there is to it. I think we now need to grow into the place where we say, yes, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus is who he is now, not just what happened 2,000 years ago. And maybe that would help people because a lot of people are really hesitant to put their faith in 2,000 years ago, a baby in a cradle. But how about putting your faith in the King of Kings who sits on the throne and what he did when he visited our planet? How important was the ascension of Jesus? I know I'm beating this to death, but I, you got to grow into this. I want us to grow into this together. Jesus said, if I don't go back to the Father, if I don't ascend, the Spirit of God cannot come. We don't have the Holy Spirit here to live within us, to guide us, to teach us, to comfort us, all those things, if he doesn't ascend on high. I take you to Romans chapter 15, verse 13. I pray, the writer says, that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Watch this. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. How can you and I live in a, a world of death and have confident hope only through the power of the Holy Spirit, who came, by the way, because Jesus ascended? It's such an important part of the story. It's who He is now, as I've said a hundred times. I just hope you grab it because it's what gives us hope. It was said in a town that two elderly women were dying at the same time, one on one side of town, one on the other. And as they died, they died on the same day. One of those ladies was surrounded in opulence. She was so wealthy, maybe like Mrs. Winchester. And she had always had everything she wanted. And in her dying breath, she said, I'm leaving home with tears streaming down her cheeks. The other woman was very poor, poverty stricken, didn't have much in life. As she breathed her last, the last thing she said is, I'm going home with a smile on her face. That's the difference. That's the difference between believing just in a baby Jesus and believing, yes, he was a baby. He did die for us, was risen from the dead, but he now is home and that's where I'm going. See how important this is? I just think it's a great step of growth for us this time at Christmas. Now, you don't have to take that step of growth, but I sure hope you'll join us in this. Have a great Christmas. Enjoy the baby Jesus, but more so, enjoy who Jesus is right now. Thanks for joining us.